Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm the founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm honored to have Herschel Gordon Lewis. Herschel Gordon Lewis, internationally recognized, is a major authority in advertising and direct marketing. He's been honored in the Direct Marketing Association's Hall of Fame. He's the author of over 31 books on the topic of direct marketing and copywriting, including On the Art of Writing Copy, Effective Email Marketing, and many more. He's also known as the American filmmaker known for splatter subgenre horror films, and he's often called the godfather of gore. Herschel, thank you so much for joining me. I am pleased and honored to be to be your guest today. So how did you get the nickname Godfather of Gore? Well, it, I won't go through the entire history, but as you may be aware, Jeremy, I started off as a school teacher. I taught English literature after going to Northwestern for about 5,000 years at Mississippi State and became, I think because of I didn't have a Southern accent, their director of broadcasting, which led me into the broadcasting world and from that into the advertising world. And one day we were shooting some television commercials at a little studio in Wabash Avenue in Chicago. And the fellow who ran that studio had hands of gold, but he was not a, a businessman. And I became his partner. That my one of a number of areas in which the corruption began, maintained itself and reached full speed. And one thing I noticed was that major company movies are often very poorly campaigned. The result of that was my invasion of the movie industry on a feature film business. Now the question became, what kind of motion picture might there be that the major film companies either will not make or cannot make? And leaping out of the void came that marvelous four letter word, G-O-R-E. There were all kinds of regulations against against nudity and various kinds of violence, but gore had been ignored because no one had ever done it. And really, almost on an experimental basis, because my specialty is to make films for no money at all. Uh, that's, that's a rather peculiar reputation to have, but I revel in it because my movies don't lose money. And when I see that uh, Disney took a $200 million write-down on John Carter, and they're losing their rear ends on that thing with Johnny Depp, uh, the Lone Ranger. I think it's largely because they don't know how to campaign a movie anymore, since good old Walt died, or whatever the reasons are. Regardless, the, there's no gap between writing a successful direct response ad and writing a campaign for a motion picture. And it's especially true now, where newspapers are no longer the number one outlet for what we'll call force communication, in which we try to either regulate or establish a state of mind just by the use of words, not necessarily by the use of celebrities. You may, well, you're an academician. Daniel J. Boorstin said, a celebrity is someone who is well-known for his well-knownness. Right. My opinion, and it, it really does translate down into the world of motion pictures, is the picture is more important than the star. Nobody goes to see a movie because Robert De Niro is in it. Yes, he enhances the movie. He's a good actor. Okay, he's a good actor. Big deal. I'll get somebody off the street whom I'll pay $50 a day. Is that going to damage the movie? Not mine, because people don't go to see Robert De Niro in my movies. They go to see somebody get shredded or whatever other primitive effect we may have. Right. Now let's translate that over into the world of direct response. Key word here is response. I look at the TV and I chuckle sometimes. The amounts, not millions, billions of dollars being wasted on somebody's ego because that person thinks it's clever. And I have a rule. I used to have a, in a speech. I don't do it anymore because it's become so primitive. Everybody's heard it 5,000 times. The four great laws of force communication. 
And I'll give them to you because yeah, some your viewers or listeners may not know. Yeah. One, reach and influence at the lowest possible cost the most people who should respond to your message. Now, notice how that differs from Madison Avenue. It's not reach the most people. It's reach the most people who can and should respond. And that at once puts a curtain between you and the people on whom you're wasting money. There's an announcement coming over the system here, but ignore that too. Okay. Am I losing my head here? It dropped uh, down for a second. There. There you go. Okay. I often lose my head. <laughs> You're the Godfather Gore. All right, but one, that law is often the second most violated by people in conventional advertising who think you have to be clever because their intention is not to move merchandise or, or our concepts. Their intention is to outwit the recipient of the message. Second great law, in this age of skepticism, Jeremy, we are up to our eyeballs in skepticism. Those people out there don't believe it. If they see it, if they hear it, if they are part of it, they don't believe it. People are surprised when something performs the way it's been advertised to perform. They are surprised when something we say is free is actually free. Right. They don't believe us. And we should not feed that skepticism by being tricky and having all these asterisks, which at the bottom saying not valid between January 1st and December 31st. Right. But that happens all the time because they're trying to outwit rather than trying to sell. A good salesperson doesn't give you that opening at all. He dismisses your complaints before we can even mention them. The third great law is a simple equation. E squared equals zero. I am pleased to tell you that is not Albert Einstein. <laughs> I was thinking that's where you're going with Galactic that. travel. <laughs> what it means is when you emphasize everything, you emphasize nothing. And if you go online today, you will see a whole, and you especially because you're in business and I'm in business, and anybody who gets a whole batch of emails when you first sit down at your desk in the morning. Eight ways to do this, five ways to do this, ten things you should do that. I've quit doing that altogether. That is a suppressor of response. You select the key selling argument and subordinate the rest. And the fourth great law is the simplest of the bunch and the one that's most often violated. Tell the viewer, reader, or listener what to do. And we see this stuff that rhapsodizes, but doesn't tell them what to do. You have them in this fist. And you let them slide out the side. Uh-uh. When you have them, you grab them, and you generate one of the great motivators, guilt. If I pass this up, and guilt is extremely hard to generate today. Nobody feels guilty about anything. They don't feel guilty about murder, let alone them passing up your offer. So that I, I didn't mean to encapsulate my entire philosophy in one outburst there, but you opened the gate. Yeah, well, tell me this. Tell me one of those campaign, one of your successful campaigns that did encapsulate all those, so we can see an example. <laughs> well, in, in what, well, I'll tell you what. I'm, I'm violating some of my own principles here because I tend to lurk in the shadows. And I'm, I'm not really a, a, a total human being. I'm a, I'm a hologram. But if you look over the years, I, I'm no longer in that position. But with Omaha Steaks, with whom I did business for over 30 years, and Fred Simon, who at the time was the head of Omaha Steaks, was the son of the founder. In fact, it was very pleasant for me when I was inducted by some accident into the Direct Marketing Hall of Fame. My fellow inductee was Fred Simon. But together we worked out a campaign. Just to, Now the reason I came to Fred Simon in the first place because of a different kind of success I'd had. A company in McAllen, Texas. You see, one benefit of what I do, I can be on the tennis court at 11 in the morning and on the keyboard at 11 o'clock at night and nobody cares as long as the, the, the words are there by nine o'clock the next morning. Right. Which is why I'm able to do business with companies overseas. I have a big client in Greece and his biggest his biggest business is in Ukraine. So he's temporarily at a horrible standstill, which has nothing to do with marketing. 
that has everything to do with international relations. There was a company called the International Museum. And the International Museum had the annual Rose Society collector's plate. A collector's plate, and collector's plates were very hot during the 1980s and part of the 1990s. They've now slipped into oblivion. But with a porcelain plate with a picture on it. I discovered early on, people didn't care what the picture was. What they cared what was on the back. Really? Exclusivity. How did you we, know that? Well, my wife Margot developed that uh, with putting the individual registration number on the plate. People began phoning, saying, I want to make sure that I own that number. It's very strange what people will do when they are given an opportunity to feel they are unique. Mm -hmm. Now, with much of the writing, I see it's eunuch, but that's, that's, that's my competition. Well, for the International Museum, we had a nice campaign going, and the fellow who ran that business, a man named Frank Schultz, a truly lovely man, whom I knew only peripherally. We'd met, I think, twice because he was a scuba diver, and so were we. And we would uh, go out for three or four days in the Gulf of Mexico or someplace and scuba dive. But I didn't regard Frank as a, a close friend, but he felt that I knew how to market something. He said to me one day, and it's a day that becomes really a, a point of history. He said, I have another company, and we cannot seem to beat our control. Do you want to take a shot at it? I said, sure. His other company turned out to be Ruby Red Grapefruit, which had nothing to do with collector's plates. But I wrote a package for Ruby Red Grapefruit, and Frank told everybody, and it turned out he was on the board of the Direct Marketing Association. I had no notion of this. As far as I was concerned, he was just somebody who wanted a job done. That's what I am. Mm -hmm. I'm a hired Hessian. You want a package? Okay, for this amount of money, I'll write your package. You want me to have my artist do the art? I can do that. If you want email, do this. If you want it all text, tell me that because all text tends to pull as well as a produced message. But you see, you can't even tell that to people today. They grew up, this latter, oh, I'm going to sh shift this eye piece again, which has slipped away. You tell people that, and it's at variance with their own personal history. And I will say to whoever might be watching this today, Jeremy, when you begin to match your message to your personal history, instead of to what those people regard as their personal history, you are not a professional. You're a dilettante, and I enjoy very much having dilettantes as competition. So uh, that's basically the history. I started, as I think I told you, as a school teacher, and yeah. I was teaching English. Where did you get your knack for business? Because, you know, I mean, English what? professor and then direct marketer don't, you know, necessarily always, you know, it doesn't go on an even stream. No, I know that. that. Yeah. In fact, academicians often are very poor salespeople. And I see that sometimes when a business will hire a teacher or a professor in between semesters during the summer to represent that person, that company, on a sales basis. Right. And it often fails because that person is too academic. Right. If you're going to sell something, it's not just enthusiasm. Enthusiasm can be a turnoff. But the notion that the person who is giving you a message has some intellectual capacity to appreciate and understand, that blunts your automatic rejection situation. So salesmanship is not that big a deal. You go into a department store, what used to be Marshall Fields, now Macy's, and here's a fellow men's shirt department. All the shirts are over there. That's a clerk. The salesperson said, oh, I'm very pleased to see you because right there is your shirt. Now, even if you don't like the shirt he shows you, you feel guilty if you turn it down without looking at it. So at once he has passed the first station of the cross. So how did you get your knack for it? Because you also, with the, the films, you saw a person who was very talented, but you brought kind of that business savvy into it. That's the whole key. And it's not just business savvy. When I first started this with somebody who's going to plump a seat down to the a theater, it had to go through the theaters then. Right. That's no longer true. A lot of major company product is sold directly on DVD, and that's tough stuff for an independent. Right. But at the time, 
How was I going to get a theater to take my piece of junk, which cost nothing to produce and didn't have in it, not just Robert De Niro, but it, it didn't have Cary Grant or somebody like that in it? Answer, bookkeeping, which comes to our, our benefit, too. And that's why so often an unproduced message on email will outpull a produced message. Because for the same number of dollars, you can reach more people with the same information. And information becomes superior to just the technique by which that information is transmitted. Some people, you'll see them looking at a, a computer screen, uh, 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 and you've lost them. Because that finger's on that god-awful thing. Here it is, the, the mouse. Whatever I just did. Oh, they're okay. <laughs> and... That, that's our enemy. So I've forgotten quite what the point what I was trying to establish here, but they, I will make a point, and that is that going from the world of academia to the world of commerce yeah. is a matter of understanding who your targets are. Yeah. I can stand, uh, that's one thing I learned, luckily for me, in the classroom, where I would be emoting some rather abstruse business about uh, Robert Browning's poetry of the Victorian era. And uh, as you folks may know, uh, Queen Victoria was crowned in 1837 and ruled until 1901. Who gives one horse's rear end? <laughs> what they care about is getting a decent grade on the test. Yeah. That's all they care about. Okay, you have a choice. If I am Mr. Chips, I say, I don't care what your choice is. Here's mine. And you're going to face it on the exam. If I am a little more relaxed in what I do, and I say, come on, these kids come out of a high school where the teachers get $14 a week, give them a break here. So you make a decision. And that's what you do really when you're creating an advertising message. I shouldn't say what you do, Jeremy. I should say what you should do, and I shouldn't say you, because you're highly sophisticated in this business. But a lot of people who are our competitors are not sophisticated. What they are, are they are simply journeymen who are cast into this role. And here is somebody who is out of school, got an MBA. BFD, big deal. <laughs> and they're, they're hired as, as, as the creative teams. It's all right with me if they become contact people with a three-piece suit. That's, what the, that's who out, comes out to, to nail you. But now it's a moment of truth. Is the campaign going to succeed or not? One of the clients whom I treasure, and they are a current client, is right there in the Chicago area. It's called Hearing Help Express, mm -hmm. and they are in DeKalb, Illinois. They sell hearing aid batteries. That's their big business. Number one, I don't have a hearing aid, I'm pleased to tell you. Number two, I don't know zilch about hearing aid batteries. I know there are four types now, but I'm selling them. I better know something. Number three, I learned selling computer software. You don't have to know how it works. You have to know that it works. And I'm long since past that strange battle I used to fight where somebody would say to me, don't you want to see how this operates? Answer, no. Because the person to whom I'm selling it will be terrified if I start laying out the mechanical and technological aspects of whatever it is I'm selling to that person. Right. So you deal within the experiential background of the message recipient, not the message sender. And as you seem to be understanding here, I'm saying the same thing over and over again in a whole bunch of different ways. That you approach somebody based on what that person wants not on what you want to sell. Yeah. How did you make uh, that transition from film to copywriting? Well, there is no transition. It's the same thing. Because if I'm going to make a movie, I'm not making it to salve my ego, especially with the kind of movies I turn out. Yes, the reason I started making movies of a feature length in the first place, it's now somewhat obsolete. I had bought a 35 millimeter movie camera. The studio, when I first bought in, had only 16 millimeter equipment. The big agencies were all going to California to shoot their commercials because the California studios had 35 millimeter movie equipment. I didn't. Okay, I've got to compete. 
So that's an element to start with. And someone says to me, how many people do you have in your blank department? I'm out of the ball game right there. I don't compete on that level. I don't have a junior writer. I used to when we had the full agency. I had people, but people, people don't buy from people. And people don't come to me anymore because I have people. They come to me so I can tell their people or create the campaign which they then execute. I don't want the 15% commission that an advertising agency, I've been there, done that. So here we have a situation in which the, the person who is creating the message says to the wall, hey you, how am I going to sell what they gave me to sell? Am I going to sell this, whether it is a message to students in a classroom, or whether it's a motion picture to someone who's in a, a store, uh, or Netflix saying, I'll pick, Netflix has about 15 of my old movies, and I regard that as a classic joke, because Netflix does not have some major company product that costs millions to make. Now, if somebody watching this right now says, hey, let's make a deal with this guy and have him make a movie. Yeah, I've got a script ready to go, guys. Just contact me and we can start shooting it. Well, not next week because I'm busy, but the week after. What will happen as the result? One of two things will happen as the result of any project you undertake, whether it's in motion pictures or in advertising or in a retail store or in a foot race on a track somewhere. You will win, you will lose. If you spend a dollar and you make a dollar and one cent, you have won. If you spend a dollar and make 99 cents, you have lost. And that is why these Latter-day Saints who are advocating Facebook are making, in my opinion, I won't call it a tragic mistake, but I'll call it a classic mistake. Because what they're overlooking is the cost per sale. I've had enough of these experiences now, and that's one benefit I can bring into this arena. I have it all day, every day, where I am matching response against monies spent. And I see this where someone says, look how many, how many leads we got. Once again, BFD, big deal. What matters are not leads. It is dollars that either come through the cash register or uh, through um, Amex or something or other, where people show that they have not just understood your message, but have related it to themselves to an extent where they are spending money. Right. And in the case of Facebook, that has not happened. It, well, it may have happened on occasion. But so you cannot deal on it in occasions. You deal in broad strokes. And where we have had the good fortune to be privy to a campaign in which we tried conventional email, we have tried print media. We have tried, tried direct mail. We have tried broadcast. Dollar for dollar, including the cost of setup and follow-up. And see, that's a factor. Because you can't just say, see us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. That doesn't mean anything at all unless you are geared to handle what comes in. And you can't say, we are geared up. How did you get geared up? Did you hire somebody? Is someone splitting his or her time to make up for it? So once again, we are in a competitive situation always. And I have found, and I'm not suggesting this to anybody, I'm just giving you a personal history, that in the ambience of the end of the first quarter of the year 2014, and by the way, I recommend people say 2014, not 2014. Once we came to 2011, the rules changed. And you see, the rules do change for almost everything. And here is this, this huge thing that landed from the planet Mars called the, the World Wide Web. And we're in the second generation now. So people should certainly understand how to use it. Yes, the old timers will tell you nothing will beat direct mail. To a sense, they have a point, provided they can say to you, we've spent this much we took in that much, and here is what we are looking for, for lifetime value. Not as a curio, not as a novelty, where we gave this free if you buy that and so on, and BOGO, buy one, get one.
but rather the amount of money invested can anticipate the amount of return. Then you have a valid statistic. Right. So, yes, direct mail is still flourishing, but you see the young kids in there, they hate it. First of all, is the discipline involved here. All right, uh, while I'm on that point, which will pull better? A one-page letter? A two-page letter? A four-page letter? Answer, yes. Because <laughs> you never can tell. Right. And depending on what you are selling and to whom, the additional cost of a longer letter will be considerably v more valid than saying, I got this all into one page. Now, when I went to school at Northwestern, I didn't have that many classes in, in commercial. There weren't any in that time. But the guy who taught the course said, if you can't say it in one page, you can't say it at all. God help me, I taught that because that's what I learned, garbage in, garbage out. I have a situation here in which for a client, and they're in Seattle, and I'm in South Florida. If I can go to Europe faster than I can get to Seattle, that isn't the point. That's not the you know, universe in which we operate. We started with a four-page letter and a brochure. As an experiment, because I love people who are willing to experiment, we tested a six-page letter in the same brochure. It pulled better. We got to the four pages. I've forgotten that now, but I, I think it was because we had a two-page letter and decided to take a shot with it. The current control in that situation is for a financial service is a 16-page letter. Wow. No brochure as a response device, but it's costing less per piece in the mail than the one it supplanted, which was about two years ago, well, which was an eight-page letter with no brochure, which we found out pulled the same letter with the brochure. What have we proved? So that no one draws the wrong conclusion, Jeremy, we have proved that for this deal at this time, that works best. We also prove that we never quit testing. Testing is our weapon. It's our blunderbuss. And we should never abandon it. I've got it. It worked. Okay, it, what might work better? And the person who, when it works, said, what might work better? Has a lot more of my respect. And the person who said, well, wait, I guess we didn't pull. What's another some... test? What's another test that you found that, that worked for a separate campaign? For, other than, than the financial service? Yeah. What's another? Uh, let me think. I've got to be careful because I've got them under a, <laughs> for some, I have a, a, a no, not, not a no compete, but I can't. I'm, like a well, non-disclosure? A dis, non-disclosure agreement here. I hadn't expected this well, question. I don't want you to uh, reveal anything you can't reveal. Oh, but I'll, I'll think of something more. What I'll about, just, what did you do with the Ruby Red, or can you talk about the Omaha? Oh, well, what, Ruby what you Red did that worked. It's now, called Red, Red, it's now called Red Cooper. Okay. And that's an interesting thing. I no longer do business with them. They probably found a local source. I'm not bothered by that. There are lot, lots of fish in the sea. But they're still using the basic campaign that uh, was developed a lot of years ago. I mean a lot of years ago. That, there, but I would point out also, as I, even as I say that, that sounds wrong because history is not a valid technique by which you gauge current events. But let me think of what might be a little more, a little more recent here for a retirement community. <laughs> At the moment, I'm embattled. They've begun to run a horizontal ad in newspapers on the first page of the second section. Why? Someone made a decision. But what we built that thing with originally was display ads, a series of them within the same issue of the newspaper. And that required a battle too because, uh-oh, I think I just lost my head. No, this is because I'm using a machine other than that one I meant to. In which, we, from page to page, a different fragment of the same sales argument was mentioned. But that won't do well either. Let me think of online of something that has worked well. If I had my, my sheet here in front of me, I could do that. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Books. 
How do you sell books today? Books are obsolete. Nobody buys books anymore, including mine. Now, my best seller, as you mentioned in the very pleasant introduction you gave, is called On the Art of Writing Copy. It's in its fourth edition. How did we build that book to a point where it sold enough copies to have a fourth edition? Of course, the first edition was before we even had the World Wide Web. So in order to maintain any kind, any kind at all of contemporaneousness, I had to have that. Well, the answer was originally direct mail. And the question was, how, why are you opening this envelope? We tested that and then tested the same wording handwritten. It blew the first uh, attempt away. At the moment, and I, I, again, I'm, I'm going, oh, I don't know what your, your own demographic is here, so I can, if we face a lawsuit, we'll both face it. For a motor club, we're trying to lower the demographic, and I'll tell you why. People who are buying memberships in motor clubs, you know what I'm talking about when I say motor clubs? No. If you would mention the initials, I would then wouldn't have to. Uh, will you own or drive a car and you break down on the road? Does that generate any thoughts on your mind? Yes, yes. Okay. The, the demographic is aging. Just as the demographic to mail order clothing, such as L.L. Bean and uh, Eddie Bauer, who, which recently sold, resold, resold, resold that company. They are aging. It's no longer under 45 over 45 is now under 55 over 55 and what does that mean it's not a matter of aarp that will take you with when you're 50 years old it makes a big deal out of it what it means is that a lot of people first are working well beyond their retirement age the classic retirement age is 65. here's somebody who's 67 has he changed or she changed the buying pattern answer yes that's because of the bulge that occurs in the messages coming to that person. It forces them into a different mindset, okay? You can cater to that mindset, you can fight that mindset. But in the case of a motor club, where someone may say, now my new newer car no longer requires that because it comes with certain guarantees and they'll haul me on a flatbed to wherever I'm going here and I don't have the problem of there and it won't change my insurance rate. How do we fight that and stay in business ourselves? Because it's not as though you're selling automobiles and I'm selling buggy whips for horse-drawn carriages. I have to be there to compete. So one of the problems that exists is matching the demographic with the message. And it's not the same thing. And so I am currently trying a, a, a line on the envelope that is aimed at people in the under 45s. That becomes increasingly easy to do as list companies become more and more sophisticated with what they will allow us to invade and offer. Mm -hmm. Because in years past, you couldn't combine easily without a, a horrible amount of expense. This peep, this group I'm appealing to, one, is under age 45. Number two, makes $60,000 a year or more. Number three, lives in exurban circumstance or rural circumstance. You see, what I, what each time I narrow the hole. In, again, in ancient, by ancient times, I mean before the year, well, let's say 2005 to 2007. The cost of compiling that would have made it prohibitive because then as we were talking about the other situation with with uh, Facebook the cost of reaching individuals exceeds the return you can expect from them that's a factor we can't just say it doesn't cost us anything for this person is not only our vice president of marketing this person spells to spend one-third of his or her time doing this with Facebook or doing that with List arg with arguing with list companies, which is, by the way, that's a talent in its own, too. Because, once again, if I'm going to mail to your prospect, and I say to you, I'm telling it in front, Jeremy, this is a test. 
if it pulls, we're going to remail it immediately. Not only to the people who are on that first list who didn't respond, because nobody responds at 100% rates. I think it was Louis Cheskin, the famous researcher, who was there in Chicago outside the Wrigley Building. He set up a table offering a dollar for a quarter. A dollar bill for your 25 cent your quarter. And most of the people wouldn't do it. They simply could not accept the notion. Nobody pulls 100%. No batter in the major leagues is going to bat 1,000. You bat 300, oh boy, you got a big raise for next year. Or you can go from free agent. So all these little pieces tend to fit together to make what might be regarded as a successful campaign. Yeah. And the smart marketer says not just to his mirror, who's the fairest one of all, but he says to his, his accounting sheet, this is why the campaign I put together is the one that they rolled out as to, opposed to the campaign that agency put together. And yeah, they've got 3,246 people on this account, and I've got one. It means absolutely nothing to the person who's getting the message. And I'm warning you right now, I'm going to pull this up. I don't know how to slid down. But there I am back. So I'll, I'll slide down. what's one of the campaigns you can talk about that's not under an NDA and, and some of the components of why it was successful from the, the headline to what you put in the body of the, of the copy? I wish you'd asked me that before because I don't have my, my I, could, I, could, I could probably display something to you. But let's go to, let me think here. Hearing Help Express, which is a local thing there. First of all, one of the key elements, which is something, I'm sorry to do this, but I don't want to disappear from you altogether and appear to have no forehead. <laughs> a lot of people in our business suffer from. Uh, the, one of the key elements is the medium itself. We chose, and look at me slide down there. I'm not even moving. I'll hold it here because we're almost out of time. The... Medium became important. We began to advertise in veterans' magazines. Now, veterans themselves are obsolete, and it's strange that some people who are not veterans will never see your message and object to it if you expose them to it. It's strange. We, we deal in human psychology. Somebody once said the only thing wrong with child psychology is it doesn't work on children. It does work on adults. So, first of all, the medium itself became important. Number two, there's an assumptive situation. And what we began to do was to tell people they are hard of hearing. But number three, and the key, I think, to the success of this message was you are paying too much. That's our campaign for Hearing Help Express. You're paying too much. That's it. And you say that to, I don't care what you're talking about, whether it's gasoline or or grapefruit so a lot of grapefruit for ruby red grapefruit <laughs> big bucks that cost you about four times what you'd spend if you went to the to the supermarket so how did you do that human psychology they weren't just getting grapefruit they were increasing the image they could project to other people and that's part of it too everybody needs that image boost and so that combination of elements has worked very, very well, uh, where it's, it's pushed them way, way up in the competitive mix. And I understand they're being, I'm sorry to do this. I just can't get this to hold. They're being courted by some of the electronic giants. And there I go sliding down again. But I'm, I'm really about out of time, Jeremy. So tell I, me, last I, question, I'm, Hershel, I know you have to go. Tell me one of your proudest accomplishments through your career. Being able to sit here and talk like this, <laughs> that's an easy one. I, I enjoy the position I seem to have in this business in which people who, whose corporate structure is considerably more advanced and more uh, and gigantic compared to just me sitting here in a chair. But they ask me for philosophical advice which gives me the happy feeling 
that they think at least that I am learned in the area era of of person to person communication. Yeah. And that makes me feel good. So what's your best advice as parting words for us? Uh, first of all, don't let your Skype go to a point where you can't where you, it keeps sliding down. On you. <laughs> My word of advice to anybody yeah. is whenever Every time, I don't care if it's somebody you love, I don't care if it's somebody you're courting, I don't care if it's someone on the outside who never heard of you. Whenever you are trying to create an image with someone who doesn't know you or who does know you, say to yourself loudly and clearly, what is it that will enhance what this person regards as a message that will help that person achieve whatever goal that person has. Not what's going to make me look good. Yeah. What's going to make them look good. Yeah. Automatically, you'll look good. Yeah. Well, thank you, Herschel, for your time. Much appreciated and for working through some of those glitches. Everyone should check out your website. Which is, Tell people where they can find you and in, in your materials. Again, I'll put this up so I can see it myself. It's www herschelgordonlewis.com. Herschel is spelled H-E-R-S-C-H-E-L-L, no space, G-O-R-D-O-N, no space, L-E-W-I-S dot com. They'll find me and I'll be there. And I thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And for me.